That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about The Passenger, the fourth feature directed by Carter Smith, which is being released on digital and on demand, courtesy of Blumhouse Productions on August 4th, 2023. So Carter Smith did Swallowed, which we've seen. Yep, you uh, reviewed that film. I did by myself. Mm -hmm. uh, Not my best work. <laughs> what else has Carter done? Uh, I mean, I've been a fan since his, I think it's his 2006 short film, Bug Crush, which Swallowed has a lot in common with. Isn't that part of an anthology? It's included in that uh, one of those boys' life. Oh, I have seen that, yes. Yes, because I included it as part of a movie night years and years ago. Yep. Um, so I've been a fan since that. And I, I like his debut, The Ruins. With, oh yes, with Jenna Malone, and uh, I I interviewed him for Jamie Marks is Dead at the 2014 Sundance Film Festival, which much like The Passenger, uh, is not really a, a queer film from him. Uh, he also did the it it technically is feature length, but that's part of the series Into the Dark is a 2018 title called Midnight Kiss, which we've also seen and I think overall liked. Uh, the Passenger, I think this is a fitting title for what the narrative ends up being, but I mean. You know, you can't confuse it with Antonioni's The Passenger with Jack Nicholson and Maria Schneider. The premise of this film, a man is forced to face his fears and confront his troubled past. He must find a way to survive when his co-worker snaps and goes on a violent killing spree. My pull quote is, The Passenger is an intriguing lesson in exposure therapy gone wrong. Uh, yeah. Uh, mine is uh, a sinister joyride about reclaiming the driver's seat in your life. Oh, that's good. I thought this movie was excellent. There isn't anything about it I didn't like. I don't have any thoughts about what could have been different, which uh, is rare for me. <laughs> I did overall like this film. I think you liked it a slightly a bit more than I did. It is uh, familiar, but it does have some very nice emotional moments, and I think the two leads are really good. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I think Kyle Gallner is finally kind of stepping out uh, in, in a way that I really enjoy, because I, I remember him you know, being in a slew as a kind of an angsty teenager in a slew of horror movies like Jennifer's Body and the Nightmare on Elm Street remake, um, The Haunting in Connecticut, which I hated. Uh, we saw him, he, he has a very angsty role in Beautiful Boy starring Maria Bello in 2010. And lately, I think um, he's doing other things in genre. He's in Smile, he's in Scream 5. Uh, but I think, to me, I think this is his best work to date. So the man forced to face his fears is Bradley, played by... Johnny Ber Berktold? So he works at like a fast food restaurant. Like It's like one of those rural rest stop type restaurants. I'm not sure where they live. We were at a screening, I think it was a premiere, where there was a Q&A and the director said it was filmed in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. But I don't know that it's meant to be set in Louisiana. But anyway, it's like rural something or other, right? With, with a color design in the restaurant that looks like the 1970s, yeah. Anyway, he works in this restaurant, and his co-worker, uh, Benson, is played by... Kyle Gallner. Okay. So, it's just a shitty place to work, and all of a sudden, we can get into the specifics, but Benson snaps and murders... Gets a shotgun out of his car. Three of his co-workers. Mm -hmm. and including the, including the boss. <laughs> including yeah. the manager. So, it, it's just he and Bradley left. And Benson tells Bradley, come on, we're leaving. And at first we think it's going to be like them getting away because there's a conversation about how many hours they have until the bodies are discovered and the police are called. But immediately Benson's like, well, we need to eat. So they stop at a diner. Then he goes home to change clothes. Then they just start driving and Benson's trying to get to know Bradley, who he's worked with for like, a while, it would seem. Mm -hmm. And he asked him, are you gay? No. Do you, are you a virgin? Yes. Have you ever had a girlfriend? Yes. We broke up. Why? Well, her cat died. And Benson's like, you, your girlfriend broke up with you because her cat died? That doesn't make any sense. Well, we never talked about it. Okay, well, let's go talk to her now. So when you think they're supposed to be running from like this crime he committed, they go to the mall to visit Bradley's like one and only girlfriend. And they have a conversation. And we find out that she broke up with him because he's so like passive and closed off. But she mentions that he never wanted to talk about what happened in the second grade. So, of course, we're like, what happened? 
So Benson talks to him about it. And we find out that when Bradley was in the second grade, and this is the opening of the film, like where we see that um, he, when he was... He's having a nightmare about it. He's having a nightmare about it, but when he was in the second grade, he used like a slingshot with like a rubber, uh, an eraser, and basically like knocked his teacher out teacher's eye out which he interpreted as changing her life irrevocably and he has carried a long lasting guilt that has paralyzed him yes so bradley is like well that's crazy like why don't we just go talk to her and she can tell you that she she knows you didn't do it on purpose so they go to the school Mm -hmm. get that teacher's address because it's a saturday so he finagles the receptionist to give the address to this teacher they show up at her house and she's very lovely and Miss Beard, played by yeah, Liza Wheel. I really liked her. But I did too. Yeah, she tells Bradley, like, you know, I don't blame you. And actually, I think what happened to me was for the better. But so, be- But before they got to the teacher's house. Before they get to the teacher's house and after they get her address, Benson bumps into Mr. Shepard, who's the vice principal of the school. But he used to be a fourth grade teacher. And it's not explained how Benson knows him, but we can assume that man was in his life and that Benson doesn't like him and it's not explained why, but Benson beats this man up badly to the point that he ends up dying. Mm-hmm. So when they're at the uh, Ms. Beard's house, mm-hmm. it seems like everything's all good and they're ready to go, but her phone rings and she says, hold on, I'll, 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 I'll walk you out the door, but let me answer the phone. And it's the receptionist at the school saying, girl, someone beat up Mr. Shepard and he died. And Ms. Beard puts two and two together and realizes that these two are involved. Benson snaps, takes her hostage. They go to a restaurant, a diner they had visited earlier in the film. And there's basically like a shootout. Mm -hmm. Benson gets killed. And then we see some time has passed. In the process, Bradley also got shot in the arm. We can get into it. But in, we see at the end of the film that Bradley is a more confident person. He actually is babysitting for Mrs. Beard. Mm-hmm. Ms. Beard. And I guess all's well that ends well. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's now another uh, facet of his <clears throat> passiveness. His passivity was how his mother treats him, who we only get to hear her on the we phone. We can talk about and that. He's, he's yeah. now established some boundaries with mom. So, I didn't know anything about this movie. I assumed based on Swallowed that it would be a gay horror film, which was kind of ignorant of me. But it's it's not. It's more of like a psychological like drama, kind of. Yeah, I, I, and I think the Blumhouse productions might have a misleading uh, effect on, on its release, including the poster art, because it's really... It, it makes you think, especially with the setup, that this is going to be like a queer, natural-born killer, given all the elements involved in it. And, yeah. it's, and it's really not that at all, and, and to its credit. Uh, it's written by Jack Stanley, who's got uh, a bunch of stuff in the works as a screenwriter, but uh, his previously produced credit is Lou, starring Alice and Janney on Netflix, which I wasn't such a fan of. But I think he takes very familiar elements and makes something quite interesting, especially by the time we get to the third act. I'll go through my notes. So at the restaurant, the beginning of the film, it's clearly like not a great place to work. Bradley's boss, who's not nice, calls him into the office and says, you're the only person here who actually does their job. I, I don't know why. You, what, what are your plans for the future? Bradley doesn't know. The boss says, well, there's a new restaurant opening up. They need managers. I can recommend you if you want it. And Bradley can't make a decision. He's so passive. Well, it's like he's just an eternal martyr. Yes. So there's another coworker, Chris, this like douchebag guy. And then a lady who also works there, the two of them, Chris and this lady, are a couple. And Chris is being mean to... Oh, he's a, he's a bully. He's a bully. Mm-hmm. And he forces Bradley to eat a day-old burger. Like, a burger from the previous day that had been left under the heat lamp. And then that's when Benson steps in and says, Hey, dude, like, you've gone far enough. Leave this kid alone. And then Chris threatens Benson... And Bradley's looking at Benson like, it's okay, I'll just eat the burger. But my first thought was, didn't that burger look moldy? It didn't look good. After a day? I don't know, but he didn't get sick. I don't know. I thought that burger looked crazy for just being a day old. Because you see all those videos of, well, it's those McDo- like McDonald's burgers that they have in the 
wrapper for like a year and they don't change color. <laughs> I'm sure it was fine. But, but anyway, poor, poor Bradley eats that burger and Benson snaps. He walks out the front door, goes to his car and pulls out a shotgun. And him shooting Chris specifically was pretty graphic. Uh huh. And then them cleaning up the mess and dragging the bodies. That was pretty intense. Mm-hmm. Um, which is all... I always have... Because I've traveled across country like driving many times. And I always try to avoid those like rural rest stop restaurants. Oh no. Mm-mm. I mean... I'll just be hungry. Maybe, or, maybe Waffle House. Maybe. a Well, yeah. Depending where. They're so greasy. <laughs> but um, anyway, um, I thought... I really liked Bradley. I thought that actor did a really good job of seeming so vulnerable. Mm-hmm. Fragile. I also, yeah. I also thought he looked like Blue Hydrangea. <laughs> he, he did. He does. So now that they're on the run, they stop at this restaurant, this diner, and the waitress... Marsha. Marsha. Played by Kenesha Washington. Who was so lovely, and mm-hmm. she's very friendly. And, and I also think... Benson, that actor, was very compelling. He was giving me, like, young Robert De Niro vibes. Which, I mean, you have, I don't think you've seen Taxi Driver, but yeah, Travis Bickle. Travis Bickle? Is the character he plays in Taxi Driver. Robert De Niro. Oh, oh. I thought you were saying Kyle Golner played Travis Bickle. <laughs> like, what are we talking about? <laughs> Robert De Niro. <laughs> the, he's being charming with the server... But then it switches up where he's like, so do you have kids? Are you married? How long have you lived here? What have you done with your life? Like, is this all you want to do? And of course, the server gets offended and walks away. Which is important to the story because in the end of the film, when they go back to that restaurant and now Benson has two hostages, she confronts him and says, you're wrong. You had no right to talk to me that way. You don't know my life. I have a good life. I'm a good mother, a good wife. And... I think what made this movie really like pop for me was the end because that woman, when she confronts him, Benson gets mad and gets up and shoots her in the legs. And this is when Bradley finally like stands up to Benson and says like, stop, you're wrong. And he goes, there's no point to what you're doing, which I thought was so profound, which I can get into. But he basically says like, when you offended this lady earlier today, you said, oh, it's fine. She doesn't care about what I said. It's not a big deal. Like, it, it doesn't matter to anyone what I said. But then Bradley goes, okay, you said that, but then this lady just confronted you because you did what you said did affect her, and then you shoot her. Yeah, you, you totally ruined this lady's day. And so your logic, yeah. Sent her into an existential crisis. So probably. your logic makes no sense. And then all we've been doing all day is driving in circles. Like, we, we, we never left this town. Like, what? you have no point to anything you're saying. Well, I think that's the profound part of it, too, is, is how trauma and guilt, like, cause us to drive around in those circles and cause us to be a, a passenger in our own life and... Uh, and, and I think that's what's most powerful about it. But what was so moving about it, and I think it's the screenplay that I'm really impressed by, is that there are lots of movies like this where there's a character doing things they shouldn't be doing and hurting people without any thought. And of course, there are other characters saying, like, you're wrong, you shouldn't be doing this, please stop. But I can't think of another movie off, of, off the top of my head where someone points it out so clearly, and then that character, Benson, he reacts to it like, oh, like, he freezes for a minute. For a minute, he still shoots Bradley. He still does, but accident. he gets flustered, yeah. like, oh, this, he has a point. And I, I thought that was very powerful. It is, and, it, you know, also a testament to how, you know, the adage of that we've all heard ad nauseum about how hurt people hurt people is hurt people don't really realize how they're hurting people either. After like, the first, yeah, after the first trip to the diner, they go to Benson's house to, like, change clothes. And I thought the outfit Benson chose was cute, because he's wearing, like, a Sesame Street sweater. <laughs> but when they walk into the house, Benson's mom is laid up in the living room on one of those hospital beds. And I thought that that dynamic was interesting, because clearly he's very frustrated with his life. Benson is. Which is probably what led him to the point where he just snapped. Mm-hmm. So it kind of also feels... So this movie felt like a movie we reviewed called On the Count of Three? I Yes, yeah, starring Gerard Carmichael and Christopher Abbott. That was immediately what I thought of with once we get into the thick of Benson wanting to help Bradley re... 
uh, like n navigate his own life in the small town by confronting these people that have hurt him. And there's also a molestation component to that film. So I, th I think it felt very similar. Or what's the regard. movie with, My is it Michael Douglas where he has like a nervous breakdown? Falling down. Falling down. Sure. Something like that. I mean, it's familiar, but I think it, it still felt fresh. I like the scene with the mother played by a character actress named uh, Morgana Shaw. Because she, it seems like she's like stuck on the bed and she doesn't move. Uh, but she's aware because at first she sees that Bradley has blood on him and he's like, oh no, it's ketchup. And she's like, it doesn't look like ketchup. And then Benson told Bradley, don't touch anything in the house. Mm -hmm. And as soon as Benson walks away, the mom's like, I need to make a phone call. And but she doesn't even do it. As, that's what's so, I think, sly about that scene. She doesn't do that right away. She, no. She lulls him into comfort like everything's fine here. Yeah, she's manipulative. She, she goes, just get me the phone. I got to make a phone call. Which I think gives us an impression of maybe the relationship she had with her own son. But Bradley gives her, grabs the phone and Benson freaks out. And I think even though it's not a horror film, there is a lot of tension. Mm -hmm. And in that scene in particular, there's a shot where we like, we get a shot down the hallway where we see Bradley. And then we see them because the mom wants cigarettes. So she's smoking and we see the cigarette smoke. Mm -hmm. That was very tense because, you know, it's about to go down because mm -hmm. Benson like basically beats up um, Bradley and tells him to go change. But there, yeah, there are a lot of moments where I was tense because... I think Kyle Golner, that's his name, he did a really good job of seeming like charming and kind of a, like alluring. But then, so then there were moments I'm like, oh, he just seems kind of like a gruff dad type. But then it's like, oh, then I forgot that he just like he murdered seems, three people. He like, also seems very sinister and volatile. Yes. Uh, and those come, I think the women, I pick up on that a lot more, such as the ex-girlfriend at the mall, because she's like, what the F is going on here? And uh, uh, to me, I think the best the most emotional component is with the teacher and basically her saying that she's, she'd forgiven Bradley, Randy, technically his name's Randy Bradley, uh, long ago. But she had a, a resonant line in there saying that, um, you know, everyone gets hurt. And what do you do with that? You have to find the positive and of, of where that hurt has taken you because she justifies this saying that I got hurt, I rushed in this marriage and I had a, I had a baby and I'm divorced now, but I have the thing that, I, I never thought I knew I needed, which was this daughter. I never would have had that if this um, tragedy hadn't sent me off on that trajectory. The ex-girlfriend works at like a Build-A-Bear type store at the mall, but the store she works in is called Animal Fun Stuff, which I thought was really funny. That looked, that was the saddest little store. Well, the mall is sadder. Like it's one of those malls that's like everything is I, like all the storefronts are empty or like liquidation sale going out of business. Mm -hmm. So it was just a very like depressing area to be in Benson says more than once that he doesn't work in fast food anymore which I thought was interesting because it's like I don't get a sense of his character thinks that he can transition from what has happened but I kind of like that that we don't really he doesn't have a plan he just has snapped and it's clearly not going to end well so the fact that he's saying he doesn't work in fast food anymore made me think that he, like he really thinks that there's going to be like a future past today well, beyond the, jail like and there's this contradictory nature to what he's even trying to do with Bradley because he's it's like he's trying to empower him but to a degree because he basically says I'm st you still can't tell me what to do I'm still going to control well you. because he's criticizing Benson's criticizing Bradley but then at a point Bradley points out the fact that you told me to stand up for myself basically and then I am and then you don't like it and then that's when he says well to everyone but me because I'm in charge um and then in, in the finale that is Bradley trying to placate him, saying you're still in charge. And his own epiphany, which leads him to basically suicide, saying, like, I've never been in charge of anything at all. A really important line Bradley says is that after he explains what happened in the second grade, he goes, nothing good comes from me making my own decisions. So he spent, you know, the past 10 years just crippled because he feels like no matter what he does, it's going to turn out badly. And allowing his mother to become this henpecking harpy, it sounds like, on the phone, who made him repeat second grade from scratch and, and seemingly controls every aspect of his life. Because we hear her saying things like, you got off work hours ago, why aren't you home? Right. <laughs> yeah. So, of course, Benson had taken Bradley's phone, but when they go visit Ms. Beard, he's, ben, Bradley sees like a little flip phone in her like coffee table tchotchke mess, and he takes it. 
So, of course, we think, oh, he's going to use it later to get help. And he does. When they go to the diner, Bradley convinces Benson to let him go poop. And while he's in the toilet, he calls 911. But that call was so frustrating. That's frustrating because it's like, use your words. But say, he can't. He's like, ah, oh, there's a guy a with a gun. And, of course, sitting there, you're like, fool, tell them you've been kidnapped and someone's holding you at gunpoint in the restaurant. And the, and the name of the woman who's also been kidnapped. Right, but he you. can't do it. And it makes sense why he can't because he's just paralyzed. But... There was a lot of tension in that final moment. Um, so when everything's said and done, and we fast forward to Bradley babysitting f- for Ms. Beard, the way he was like talking to the daughter, I thought, is he dating her now? Did you think that? Yeah, I was unclear at first. I certainly but... didn't think he was babysitting. So that threw me for a loop. And then... But she pays him. She pays him. Like, it's very clear that they're just friendly now. But then... Ms. Beard is telling her daughter, like, oh, if you clean up, we can have popcorn for dessert. Oh, yeah, you made a noise. But you, you know, know how disappointed I would be if you told me we were having... That popcorn would have to be covered in caramel with, like, M&M's stuck in the... <laughs> yeah, she needed to specify what kind of popcorn. Because you can, you know, you can throw some candy bits into popcorn. Or if it was a like caramel just... apple covered in popcorn, maybe. I don't Sweet know. and salty with M&M's. Yes. Like, there's a way to make that dessert-like, but that is not the dessert. I have a feeling that lady was like, we can put some kettle corn in the microwave. Ugh. It looked like they don't consume a lot of sweets. Yeah. yeah. Um, what would you give this movie? Three and a half. I would give this movie four out of five. I thought it was excellent. Anything else? No. Hit the thanks button. Listen to our podcast. Bye.